Let's return to the prophet Ezekiel. We'll read Ezekiel chapter 9. All of Ezekiel 9. He, that is Christ, the fiery Christ, he cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have the charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house, the house being the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said in my hearing, Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. He said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth. And they went forth, and slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face, and cried, and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury? Upon Jerusalem, and said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord saith not. And as for me also, mine eye shall not spare. Neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the ink horn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. Amen. Last week, beloved, we saw that Ezekiel 8 through 11, these four chapters, constitute one grand vision. A vision that you might remember that Ezekiel received on the 18th of September, 592 BC, when he was bodily in Babylon with some guests at his house, the elders, while spiritually he was in the temple in Jerusalem being transported there by Jesus Christ who grabbed the prophet by a lock of his hair, transferring him way to the west, to the holy city. And here's the relationship between Ezekiel 8 that we looked at last Lord's Day and chapter 9, our subject this morning. Chapter 8 details Israel's sin. 
following hot on its heels, chapter 9, treats God's judgment upon Israel for her sin. Chapter 8, you will recall, contains a guided tour around the temple, a guided tour of idolatry. Chapter 9 starts off at that same temple and treats the slaughter of the idolaters. Let's look together at seven angels and the slaughter in Jerusalem. Seven angels and the slaughter in Jerusalem. First, the terrible slaughter that's detailed in verses 1 through 7. Then, the prophetic intercession, verses 8 through 11, when Ezekiel cries out, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel? And then finally, the implied calling, the chief calling for the people of God that ought to be drawn from this chapter. Seven angels and the slaughter in Jerusalem. The terrible slaughter, the prophetic intercession, and the implied calling. The first thing we need to do, beloved, is fix in our minds the various parties that are mentioned in Ezekiel 9, because otherwise you may well get confused. We begin with Ezekiel himself. In the vision, the prophet is in the inner court of the temple, just outside and to the east of that grand edifice. We know that because that's where he's described as being in chapter 8, verse 16, and chapter 9 just continues the narrative from there. Next, we have our Lord Jesus Christ, a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, because we are 592 years BC, as we saw earlier, a visionary appearance of Christ, because this is in a vision, and a fiery appearance of Christ. I read last time, and I'll do it again, Ezekiel 8 verse 2. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire. From the appearance of his loins or waist even downward, fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. This one is the same one of whom we read in chapter 9 verse 1, he cried also in my ear. And this fiery Christ is the glorious tour guide in chapter 8, as we saw last week. And here he's presented as the Lord of the angels. In chapter 8, he's guiding Ezekiel. In chapter 9, he's commanding the angels to do specific tasks. And so we come thirdly, Ezekiel, Christ, to the seven angels appearing here, as verse 2 says, in the form of men, as they often do in the Bible. Six of these seven angels are angels of destruction, armed with deadly or lethal weapons. And one of the angels is, as it were, a scribe. He doesn't carry a battle axe or anything like that. He has a writing kit hanging by his hips like a scribe, not a warrior. And this brings us, of course, to the people in Jerusalem, most of whom are ungodly, but some of them are opposed to their wickedness and grieve over it. So I hope after going through all that, that you've got it. Because you need to have these parties straight in order to follow the vision. We're going to work through the vision shortly. Ezekiel 9 deals with the prophet Ezekiel, 
the fiery Christ, seven holy angels, six as warriors, one as a scribe, and then the people in Jerusalem, most of whom were wicked, but there were some elect, believing, godly seed. And also I should add, because verse 3 mentions it, there is in this vision the glory of the God of Israel in the form of a great bright cloud of raging, consuming <coughs> fire. And that's mentioned in chapter 1 verse 4. And this glory of the Lord is mentioned then in chapter 3 and chapter 8 and chapter 9 and chapter 10 and elsewhere in the book. And it's the same, essentially, as that pillar of fire that led Israel through the 40 years wilderness wanderings or the glory of God that settled first upon the tabernacle when it was dedicated and later Solomon's temple. Now with all this in mind, you'll be able to follow Ezekiel's vision here in chapter 9. It begins with the pre-incarnate and fiery Christ with a loud and authoritative voice summoning seven angels to himself in the inner court of the temple. And Ezekiel's also there, as verse 1 adds, listening and observing. And their response is this, verse 2, from the perspective of the observant Ezekiel. Behold, six men came as summons from the way of the higher gate which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in, went into the inner court just in front of the temple, and stood beside the brazen altar in the center of that courtyard. The brazen altar being the place where animal sacrifices were offered. Speaking of Christ's cross. You may have noticed that they came in through the north gate. That's deliberate. Because number one, north. That's the direction from which the Babylonians would come to massacre God's people. Jeremiah and Ezekiel always make that clear. The menace from the north. And Ezekiel 9, talking about the angels, they are the visionary equivalents of the swords of steel that will slaughter the Jews in about six years' time from the vision. And secondly, the north is the location, the north gate, of two of the four scenes of idolatry in the previous chapter included in the guided tour. Listen to Ezekiel 8 verse 5, the first stop. Then said he, the fiery Christ unto me, Ezekiel, son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy that provoked God to jealousy in the entry or entrance. And then the third stop, verse 14, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz, fertility God. And here we see that the place of sin is the place of judgment. And the door that lets in idolatry is also the door that lets in God's wrath. And now with the wrath of God about to break forth, the glory of God moves. Verse 3. 
the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. God's glory and majesty moves from above the Ark of the Covenant. The word cherub here is singular, but it's used as also in Ezekiel 10 and elsewhere, a singular for the collective. The glory of God moves from his throne above the Ark of the Covenant, for there were two angels on either side of the mercy seat looking <coughs> downwards and inwards. He removes from the Ark of the Covenant to the temple's threshold. At the entrance to that great building pointing towards the east. And so now in the inner court of the temple we have the fiery Christ issuing commands. We have Ezekiel watching and listening. We have the seven angels assembled and we have the glory of the Lord by the temple building's threshold. Christ now speaks first of all to the single scribe angel. Verse 4. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. This mark, on the forehead, mind you, public, therefore, identifies those in Jerusalem who are not to be destroyed. And we're going to come to this much more fully later in the sermon. <coughs> Next, Christ addresses his commands to the six warrior angels, commands which could be summed up in two words, Follow and slaughter. Follow the scribe angel. Go behind him. And then if he marks somebody, don't slaughter him. But if he doesn't mark somebody, wipe him out. Follow and slaughter. Everyone in Jerusalem, apart from those whom God sets aside for himself by the mark. And in this connection, the Lord Jesus gives us crucial lessons regarding God's judgments upon the ungodly. The first is that judgment begins at the house of God. The fiery Christ says to the six slaughtering angels in verse 6, Begin at my sanctuary. That's where you've got to start. And begin there because idolatry and apostasy by the visible church are the most wicked and offensive sins to God. He's jealous for his own proper worship. And then begin there too because the church being the church, sins against knowledge. The pagans, in one sense, with regard to the scriptures now, they don't know any better. But the church has received the oracles of God. Their sins are worse. Start there. And this teaches us that we in the church need to be careful, very careful, lest we slide into apathy, and coldness and backsliding and departure and go on that slippery slope that leads to Ezekiel 8 which leads to Ezekiel 9. And this word in Ezekiel 9 verse 6 to the six destroying angels begin at my sanctuary is carried over into the New Testament in 1 Peter 4 verse 17 the apostle says 
For the time is come that judgment must begin in the house of God. Judgment must begin in the house of God. That's what Ezekiel 9 verse 6 is teaching. And then Peter adds, And if it first begin at us, what will the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? <coughs> Judgment begins at the house of God. And second, church office bearers will be judged first, even within the church and the house of God. Because verse 6 not only says, begin at my sanctuary, but we read, then they began at the ancient men, the elders, which were before the house or temple. And the ancient men are the same as the ancients mentioned in chapter 8, verse 17. That is the elders, the ones whom we saw during stop number 2 of Christ's guided tour when Ezekiel works his way through the hole and sees a door and goes into this mysterious room where there are all forms of creeping things, abominable beasts and idols portrayed on the wall. And there are 70 elders in Israel led by Jaazaniah from a noble family and they're offering up incense, incense in the dark, physically and spiritually. They get it first. And they deserved it too. And the New Testament teaches, James 3 verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters. And master there is often in the New Testament, A.V. means teacher, like a headmaster is a head teacher. Be not many teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. And that's a sobering thing. To believers, something you ought to think of with regard to taking church office or teaching, God says, well, you know, if you're going to teach, I'm going to hold you to a stricter standard of judgment. And this also means that those who teach and who are unconverted and ungodly in the church receive a fiercer punishment. Judgment begins at the house of God with the church and even more precisely with the leaders in the church who are responsible for the awful idolatry and apostasy and they deserve everything they get. And then third, lest you think that, well, that's okay, I'm not in any of those ranks, the passage states that no unbelieving or unconverted people in the church will be spared. Here are the fiery words of the fiery Christ to the holy avenging angels. Smite. That's the first word. Smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Don't feel sorry for them. Don't turn back from judgment and say, oh, I'm too gentle. I couldn't do that. <coughs> Smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. It's all justice, no mercy whatsoever, no room for it here. Slay utterly, old and young, both maids and little children, and women. You're familiar with the Titanic, let's say, when it's going down and there are a few boats carrying off those who may yet be rescued and saved. Women and children first. Well, here, there's none of that. Women as well as men, young as well as old, and it even says little children too are to be destroyed. Unbelieving, ungodly little children in the church who don't want the word of God, 
who disobey their parents and don't walk in the truth, they will be destroyed by God too. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 5. We must all, each one of us, irrespective of sex or age, every last one of us appear before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And only those who believe from the heart are saved. Those who look to the cross of Jesus Christ, their Savior, to deliver them from sin and bring them into peace with God. So that the redeemed, the thankful people of God, keep God's law out of gratitude. And even the young ones do it too. And we do not live in idolatry. And now, the text moves to focus on Ezekiel. Ezekiel is left alone before Christ and the glory of God because the scribe angel, he has already departed. He's putting marks upon certain people in Jerusalem on their forehead. The six warrior angels have followed him and Ezekiel is beholding the slaughter and they're going down like flies. There's slaughter in the temple grounds beginning with the 70 elders worshipping the unclean beasts and creeping things and whatnot. The courts are filled with dead bodies and their corpses defile God's holy sanctuary. And then once that's done, the slaughtering angels move out and massacre the people in the city. And Ezekiel's response is this. While they were slaying them, and I was left alone before the glory of God and the Christ consisting of fire from loins up and loins down, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in the pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? And here's the idea. God's fury has already been poured out in various stages over the northern kingdom. The tribes in the north were devastated and taken away. The tribes in the east on the other side of the river Jordan, they went too. And in this little rump state of the northern kingdom got smaller and smaller until finally the capital city, Samaria itself, fell and they were finished. And then more wrath was poured out, this time not by the Assyrians but by the Babylonians, when that army invaded and took over all of Judah except one city, the city of Jerusalem. And if all of God's people in Jerusalem are slaughtered, then that's all the people of God in the promised land wiped out. And so Ezekiel intercedes because his anguish has the force of an intercession as a prayer for other people. Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in the pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? And in his answer, the Lord, the Christ of fire, justifies the slaughter of the Israelites. He talks about the greatness of their sin that warrants their destruction. The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great. They have to be wiped out. He talks about the geography of their sin. There's the city of Jerusalem and the land. They're both involved. He refers to the nature of their sin. Bloodshedding and perversity. The land is full of blood and the city full of perverseness. And then he refers to the blasphemy of their sin. This is what they are saying. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. 
And here earth means land. The land of Canaan. The promised land. They say God has forsaken the land. And the Lord saith not. Which incidentally is the same thing they were saying in chapter 8 verse 12. As we saw last week. In other words, the God of heaven and earth. The God of Israel, Jehovah. He's blind. He doesn't see any. He's blind. And he's unfaithful to all his promises. Including the promises to the land. And we, his people upon this land. The Lord doesn't see anything. And he's forsaken the land. And therefore, out of this wicked heart of unbelief, they worshipped idols. And God is saying to Ezekiel in response to his intercession, I am fully justified in slaughtering all these people. They deserve it for their wickedness. And do you think that the holy God will have any difficulty justifying his destruction of the world by fire at Christ's return? Will it be a hard thing for him to prosecute his case and to prove to the entire universe that after so many thousands of years and the development of iniquity manifesting itself in the man of sin and his universal kingdom, that this is exactly what the world deserved? And do you think on the judgment day, when all the books are opened and the whole, whole human race is assembled before the great white judgment seat of Jesus Christ, that there'll be some good lawyers or clever criminals, as it were, amongst those judged, who can say, ah, but Lord Jesus, that's not fair. We don't deserve everlasting punishment. God is prosecuting his case here, defending his justice. The massacre and the slaughter is fully warranted. And so the Lord Jesus concludes, as for me also, as well as these six angels who are the executors of my vengeance, as for me also, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And the people of God confess that Jesus Christ is right. We're content. We rest in his supreme justice and we don't argue back and we don't say, well, that wasn't fair. No, it was fair. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? And then right on cue, the angel scribe, having completed his work, brings his report in verse 11. I have done as thou hast commanded me. That is, I've gone right through the city. I've put a mark upon all the godly in Jerusalem. And therefore, they will not and cannot be slain in God's terrible punitive wrath that sends people to hell. In other words, there is still a remnant. And now we can see the unity and the force of the last four verses of our text. Ezekiel is distraught, having seen the slaughter in the previous verses. He's distraught because he fears that God will wipe out absolutely all of Jerusalem, which is the only remaining part of Israel in the promised land. And then Christ explains to him, that yes, I'm destroying all these people, but it's perfectly just. And then the scribe angel reports that for all that, there is an elect and godly remnant who have been marked and therefore spared. And so Ezekiel's concern and prophetic intercession, it's not this. That he's praying for absolutely everybody in Jerusalem. His concern and his prophetic intercession is for the elect remnant. It's just like Abraham's intercession recorded in Genesis 18. 
He was not praying that the Almighty would spare the impenitent homosexuals in Sodom. He was praying that God would not allow Lot or any of his elect to be consumed by the fire and brimstone which would fall upon Sodom and which symbolized hell. Listen to Abraham's prayer in Genesis 18 verse 15. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous, like Lot, with the wicked, the homosexuals in Sodom, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Lord, you can't do that. You can't destroy a righteous man like Lot, who's elect and redeemed and called, along with the impenitent homosexuals, with fire coming down from heaven as a picture of hell. You can't do that. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And therefore, the Lord, gladly yielding, as it were, to Abraham's prayer, sent down angels who grabbed Abraham, and, or Lot rather, and brought him by the hand out of the city. Well, here, in Ezekiel chapter 9, Ezekiel is praying, Ah, Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue or the remnant of Israel? Are you not going to spare the elect, the few who still believe by thy grace? Yeah. But God will. And that's why in verses 9 and 10 he explains the justice of destroying the wicked. But in verse 11, the scribe angel says, I've done as you said. I've sealed in the foreheads thy people. They will not be slaughtered. Having worked our way through this chapter, beloved, we come now to the chief implied calling of Ezekiel 9, which is to emulate the behavior of of those who receive that mark in their forehead. You see, Ezekiel 8 is not only clear, but especially vivid regarding the idolatry, as we saw last week. It's incredibly popular. Most of the people are into it deeply. The men and the women. The leaders are promoting it. The elders and the priests. And it's found right at the heart and center of the nation in the holy temple precincts. Two of them are there by the north gate. Then there's this chamber where they're looking at images. And then they're worshiping the sun towards the east with their back to the temple. And yet... The godly remnant in Ezekiel 9 do not participate in the, elect, in the idolatry. They're not carried along by it. They do not agree with the idolatry. And they're not merely indifferent to it. They don't simply disapprove of the idolatry. They don't merely dislike it. The true remnant of God detest the idolatry and flowing from that they mourned over it according to verse 4 these are the ones upon whom the angel put the mark the ones who sighed and cried over it and here cry doesn't mean shed tears though they may have been there too it means a cry <coughs> with the voice that is the as one translator puts it, they moaned and groaned about it. Not with the moaning and groaning of a negative person who's in a bad way of going, it's always grumbling, but the moaning and groaning with a deep inner grief. And this is the calling of the people of God. And then these same people who mourned and groaned sighed and cried over the idolatry how did they view it 
What terms did they use to speak of what was going on in the temple, the heart of the nation, with most of the people and the leaders following it? They didn't just say politely, well, I'm a more religious sort of person. What's happening up there? It's just not my cup of tea. I prefer to worship in a different way. That wasn't how they approached it. They didn't say, you know, it's pretty bad down there. I really don't like it. They thought of the idolatry going on at the heart of their nation and even used the same word that God used for all the idolatry. They said, what's going on in the one church of God on earth in the promised land is abominable. It's nothing but abominations. That's the word in verse 4. The men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. They viewed the whole thing, all the four forms of idolatry and any of the other wickedness that's alluded to in Ezekiel 8 and 9. The whole thing was detestable and loathsome. And you say, I rather like these people. These are good people. The people who were called to emulate. These are the sort of people that we need in our church. People who hate the idolatry that God hates. Let's look further at the mourning of this godly remnant. They are mourning here in this chapter over the sins of others in the visible church. Now here we need to understand that this isn't hypocrisy. You know, where somebody pretends, oh, somebody's doing this, this sin over there. And, oh, I really hate it. Isn't it terrible what they're doing? And then they indulge their own flesh. No. The ones who are mourning here over the sins of others are sincere people who are delivered from God's eschatological judgment <coughs> and damnation. And in fact, even we could say, rightly, it takes more to grieve over the sins of someone else than it actually takes to grieve over your own sins. Because if someone truly mourns over the sins of somebody else, truly, you have proof, if they're truly doing it, that they have first of all mourned over their own sins. And then, seeing the evil of their own sins, they realize other people are doing this too, including in the visible church. And they mourn over their sins as well. Here's the order then for sincere mourning over sins. First of all, think of this dawning in the consciousness of the believer. He sees his own sins and he's grieved and cries about them. And then he begins to look around him and see, wow, look what's going on here in the church world. That's terrible. And he mourns over that too. And scripture speaks in various places about mourning over the sins of others in the Old Testament in God's visible church. And strikingly and memorably, it does this especially in three Old Testament chapter 9s that start with Ezra chapter 9. Ezra 9. Ezra hears about the intermarriage in the returned community back from the Babylonian captivity now and in Jerusalem and Judah. And they're intermarrying with unbelievers and pagans. When I heard this thing, Ezra 9 verse 3 says, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard. And sat down astonished. The man was just appalled. I thought we were going to be a holy people now that we returned from Babylon. I thought Israel had learned their lesson. Look what they're doing now. Verse 6. Oh my God, I am ashamed. And blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head. And our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. That's Ezra 9. Here's Jeremiah 9. Moving forward in the Bible, but moving back a little in time. 
Jeremiah 9 verse 1, the prophet laments, Oh, that my head were waters, and mine eyes a fountain of tears, that I may weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Ezra 9, Jeremiah 9, and now Daniel chapter 9, that great prayer of the prophet. I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Ezra 9, Jeremiah 9, Daniel 9, the prophets mourning over the sins of God's people, over others, as it were, making them their own, and confessing it in the church. The one church of God at that time, we have fallen. And Amos 6 verse 6 even rebukes those who are, quote, not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. And the New Testament church too mourns over the sin of others and their coming destruction. This is seen, for instance, in the two witnesses in Revelation 11 in that they are clothed with sackcloth, just as we saw in the passages earlier read clothed with sackcloth a sign of mourning over sin and the coming judgment and the two witnesses symbolize the witnessing people of God from the first coming of Christ to his second coming this morning that characterized the godly In Ezekiel 9 verse 4. This morning was sincere. It was inward. It was also outward. In that it found vent. And it was great. The text speaks of the men that sigh. And that cry. This was a heavy burden upon them. The morning was universal. And the morning was holy. For the text speaks of the men sighing and crying for all the abominations. Not just for some of them, but all of them. Done right in the midst of Jerusalem, even in the holy temple precincts. And Jesus said, Blessed are they that mourn. That mourn for their own sins and that mourn for the sins of others, especially in the church, the church with which the person is connected. And remember in the Old Testament things are particularly bad. There really only was one visible institution. You couldn't separate and reform and start a new church. You were part of it. Even in terms of your church membership. Blessed are those who mourn. For they <coughs> shall be comforted. They shall be comforted. Because somebody could say, I don't like the sign of that morning. Morning, that, that's, that's bad news. More and more and more. Now. No, but God says, and here's the paradox, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. God comforts mourners. And those who were marked by mourning, spiritually, were then marked in the vision by the angel on their forehead. And the true people of God in the New Testament are all marked and sealed on their foreheads too. It's not the mark of the beast. That's a different thing. Revelation 7 says, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea to bring plagues upon them 
saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. They must be sealed first. The mark to protect them. And then you can go forth and destroy. Eschatological judgment will not fall on any of the true believing people of God by his grace. To use different language, the language of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the mark, the seal, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And there is no physical mark on anybody in this church. No physical mark. But we're all sealed. We're all marked. And even though there's no physical mark, the Lord knows them that are his. And he knew us even before the foundation of the world. He knew us in his electing, discriminating, gracious decree of choosing us. He knows. And then he knew us in the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, who also knew us, because he tells us that he came to give his life for his own. That is, those whom the Father had given him. I lay down my life for the sheep. And the sheep, as it were, have a seed, have a mark. They're all known to God. And God in due time sovereignly regenerates all of his own, bringing them to faith and new life, which involves causing them to repent over their own sins, which also grows into this mourning over the sins of others, especially in the church, especially in the church where they have connections that they're part of. Like Daniel's prayer in chapter 9. So the child of God leaves this morning, shortly too, confident that he's marked and sealed in his forehead and that he is safe in the arms of Jesus Christ. And in the world to come, Jesus promises in Revelation 3, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Amen. Our Father in heaven, help us to believe, to see as crystal clear vision by terrible destruction of the wicked and even the wicked in the abominable false church of the Antichrist and of all forms of idolatry and cause us, Lord God, to tremble and to follow the godly example of those who mourned and sighed and grieved. Work this in our hearts by thy Holy Spirit, and in thy fear, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.